colloquial series. Thrilled to have with us Mr. Dan Hutto. Um, I'm Bill Abramson from the Graduate School of Education and specifically from the uh, Embodied Design Research Laboratory. And I mention that because this talk, as we'll see, will be about embodiment. And in fact, uh, as we like from Berkeley, radical embodiment. Radical embodiment for cognition. Um, Dan has come to spend a couple of days with, uh, with my lab, and I promised him good weather here. The only reason it rained yesterday was because we were in San Francisco. That's right. <laughs> Which is not a state. <laughs> um, Dr. Daniel Hutter holds an appointment as a professor of philosophical psychology at the University of London, and also still holds a position at the University of Hertfordshire, his previous academic home. I had to do a bit of a geography lesson, uh, ignorant to me, to figure out where these places were. Wollongong University is New South Wales, Australia, just south of Sydney. And Hertfordshire is north of London, kind of within the airport band, if you know, so Heathrow, Luton, Stansted, somewhere up here. And in preparing this introduction, I shamelessly copy pasted from Dan's faculty page, so to make it truly authentic, I'll keep the first person. Born and schooled in New York, I finished my undergraduate degree as a study abroad student in St. Andrews, Scotland, where my maternal roots lie. I returned to New York to teach fourth grade in the Bronx for a year in order to fund my uh, Master of, of Philosophy in Logic and Metaphysics. After that, I, I carried on my doctoral work in York, England. I lived in England with my wife and three lads for nearly 20 years. Australia is our new home. My primary appointment is as a professor of philosophical psychology Made full time at Wollongong, but I also retain a quarter time appointment in that role at Hertfordshire. My research is a sustained attempt to understand human nature in a way which respects natural science, but which nevertheless rejects the impersonal metaphysics of much contemporary naturalism. In my most recent work, I have developed a basic non representational account of intentionality and phenomenal experience and proposals about what lies at the roots of our everyday social understanding. Reaching beyond philosophy, I have often been invited to speak at conferences and expert meetings aimed at clinical psychiatrists, educationalists, narratologists, neuroscientists, and most recently, sports psychologists, which is how. Uh, although an analytic philosopher by training, I adopt a broad and ecumenical approach to philosophical inquiry, willingly embracing justified insights from any school of thought. My recent research focuses primarily on issues in philosophy of mind, psychology, and cognitive science, I'm best known for promoting thoroughly non-representational accounts of inactive and embodied cognition, and for having developed the hypothesis which claims that engaging with narratives understood as public artifacts plays a critical role in underpinning distinctively human forms of cognition. So that's end of quotation, and when I use the pronoun I, I will use me. So Professor uh, Hutter's research is very dear to the work of my students and I uh, in the Embodied Design Research Laboratory. In particular, the theoretical construct he has developed with our mutual colleague uh, uh, Raul Sanchez Garcia from the Univers uh, European University of Madrid, who is a sports scientist, are enabling us to draw more tightly from the field of kinesiology and ecological dynamics in interaction with educational technology to explain the emergence of mathematical concepts. And so we are very excited to be hosting Daniel Van Berkeley. Please join me in welcoming him to the Graduate School of Education. Thank you. 
Kip give you a line on the title, you'll see in a few minutes, but just as a, a brief kind of pre preface to this, um, I'll say a little bit more about the background, but the big story, the first part is something like this. There has been something in the sea change, or at least another sea change. It seems like we can switch around on our thinking about the nature of mind and perception, and there's been a move away from um, the idea that we have to use intellectual representations from the very beginning of our encounters with others in the world towards a more embodied and active story about how this might be done. But a very standard uh, uh, view for anyone who takes this line is that this has some natural limits. That this approach can only go so far, isn't going to tell us about very, very deep or difficult notions about the mind, and there we would need to reinsert some of the more traditional classic ways of thinking, perhaps in comp complementing these more basic uh, ways of thinking. And there's a more aggressive streak, which we'll look at here too, that says actually, when we really think about it, the whole thing is off the charts. It's not going to happen. When we really understand that we need the imagination in play, and the imagination comes up very early, the idea that any cognition gets off the ground without representation is doomed. So the big plot for this is for me to do the unimaginable thing and try to convince you that actually these accounts can accommodate the imagination. So that's a kind of a magic trick, right? So people will be skeptical. Like, well, Maybe you're not, but you probably are. Um, most people are skeptical if I were to tell you you can have imagination without content or representation. So I like to do these kind of tricks. So if I, set, if I sell you, then you have to at least start thinking about these topics, right? If I can convince you that that's at least possible, that's my, my game plan. So that explains the title, Imagining the Unimaginable. Some people think that's just inconceivable, right? And so I want to give a different account of the imagination and show you that it isn't actually I will need to do some tricks to do that, uh, but I'm happy to do so. The E turn, just in general, we call it the E turn. There's lots of E's around nowadays. Um, that wonderfully colored book came out in 1991. The Embodied Mind was probably the first foundational articulation of it. Um, we have the notion of an activism and first articulated there against the idea of embodied action and Buddhist thought and whole strains from other uh, lines of thinking come into this approach. And one of the things that was interesting about this book is its authors were decidedly anti-representational in their first strong outings. And they're resisting a kind of tradition that sees the mind as essentially that of computation and representation. That strain of thinking is very old, and you can certainly see it not just more recently with the cognitive revolution through uh, people uh, like Chomsky and Fodor or others who had actually been interested in computational thinking, but as far back as Hobbes and Descartes in some various ways, this has always been a, a vision of what minds really are all about in their essence. We then find other theories connecting this strongly against Thompson, who is one of the authors on that book, writing in terms of thinking, well, look, biological phenomena, living systems, are really not computational systems, are what, where we first find our feet with minds, and that's something that we should understand in, a, in the reverse order. Computation is something that comes perhaps late for a very specialized form of being, but modeling, modeling the mind on life, at least, and sometimes a more strong metaphysical thesis is that we should actually see deep continuities between life and mind, dependent upon which advocate you're looking at. But the idea here is really a change of thinking fundamentally about what minds are. And then again, others. Uh, Tony Chimero, this is coming out of the Gibsonian, reviving ideas from the American naturalist tradition um, and Gibsonian psychology, again, pushing very strongly against the idea, as Tony puts it, that we're always involved in mental, inner, gymnastics when we understand and deal with the world, but rather that we're engaged in dynamical systems that can be understood without thinking there are any strong metaphysical divides between us and the world. Down on metaphysics, up on science, and the idea here was that this was the way the sciences need to go and they need to develop these tools. And it keeps going. There's some other related E movements. These are less clear, and you'll see as we go through it, uh, that the E family doesn't always eat nicely together at the table, right? So some people in the larger E family still retain a lot of the old computational representational thinking, and they modify that, and we'll look at that towards the end. But there is this other movement in general towards the idea that is related, and in some versions, or at least some formats, it is all about the idea that minds extend beyond 
the brain and that the thesis would be that, well, look, we, we should be looking at systems as they complete tasks and use environmental capacities and affordances in order to do that. And then there's whole more books on this and new books on the whole movement are starting to appear. And if I spend a little more time, which I will, I just wanted to put you in the frame. I could easily fill that board in about 20 seconds. This has been a burgeoning, you know, people write that at the beginning of, of, of papers all the time. The, the new wave in thinking or the new burgeoning. But this is true. I think if you, it wouldn't be difficult to see an upsurge in papers. In fact, somebody has done an analysis recently about this. And you will find that this is the new hot, hot label and seemingly hot topic. Okay. Let me say something about myself and my co-author. Um, it's not how we ordinarily dress. We did this in China for a joke. But just gives you the sense that, uh, yeah, I'm sure they took it well. The, um, the thought was that, and, and there is a reason for red wreck here. Uh, the position has been slightly vilified by some of its opponents. Alvin Goldman talks about the specter haunting the laboratories of cognitive science, and that's us. Uh, so the radical position is deemed to be exactly parallel with something like communist movement or some undesirable strain of thinking, or indeed Bodor has likened it to an infectious disease of thought. So it's not even a contentful uh, uh, promising, uh, it's, it's just a kind of a offering, it's just something to be got rid of. The thesis is to take some of those ideas to their extreme, and the argument, or the, the idea here is that understanding basic minds at least, so the roots of minds, as fundamentally relational and in interactive terms, not in representational terms. So that's the kind of purest, most extreme version of the kind of view that we defend. It's a view that denies that cognition is actually uniform. So this is not to say that we never have content involving thoughts, or that we sometimes have thoughts that can be true or false, not the claim at all, right? But those aren't the basis of our cognition. And moreover, even when we have those, we're understanding the, the primary way that we're able to have that in an interactive term. So I try to explain this to somebody else, it'd be more like saying, sometimes you have conversations without coffee, and then sometimes you have conversations with coffee. So we sometimes there are co coffee involving conversations, and sometimes not. Same with cognition. Sometimes you're making claims and thinking in those terms, but fundamentally you want to understand the dynamics in a more root fashion. So the claim is really strong in this respect. Um, so it's not to say, so it's, it's, it's broken in the sense it doesn't, it, the important point is it's not always and everywhere that the mind involves representational content and certainly not at, at its roots. And we've been promoting this around the globe for some time. To try to capture the main characters in it, we've actually brought t-shirts. I didn't bring any here today, although they exist. Um, you'll see in a moment. So we can talk about those who believe that all, con all cognition involves content. Code for kick. C-I-C. Right? All cognition involves content. You just don't have minds or cognition without content. Doesn't make any sense. Can't happen. Impossible. And that's across the board. So there's a claim that wherever you find minds, you're going to have to have some kind of content. And there are traditional variants of the ones I mentioned. Computational theories often take that view that it's just a matter of simple processing. It's literally the manipulation of internal contents. So certain visions of the mind are really wedded to that view strongly. At this far extreme as the view that I'm advancing, the one I mentioned, it's not to say that there's no minds that involve content, but that in the basic case, the basic forms, they don't, which leaves open the idea that some minds don't involve content, so it's a violation of this in its unrestricted form, right? So this, the modal operators are important. It's the idea that some cognition, perhaps a great proportion of cognition, and certainly the most fundamental rudimentary forms, don't involve content. And the intermediate form, which we'll meet in a moment as well, just so you know all the players in the, in the story, in order of appearance, um, you're going to run into a, a, a kind of bastard of these two ideas, which is that it may be the case that all cognition involves content in some way, but that's compatible with much of the E program. So call this conservative inactive embodied cognition as opposed to radical inactive embodied cognition. And a lot of the interesting work in the field now has been debates between which of these two um, 
modernized ways of thinking is the one that's going to tell us the truth about how we should think about minds. It's a debate between how much. I call this in other places the retention problem. Yes. Sir, can you define content? Yes, I will. I was going to. That's coming, but I'll do it now. I'll do it now. Um, so content here would be the most pristine version would be something like the content of your thoughts, such that you could think something that would be true or false. And you'll see a little later on, representational content will be defined as, and for our opponents too, and I'll demonstrate that this is their view. It's usually propositional content in, in analytic terms, but it can be wider than that. But it's mainly simply the idea that it's a way of thinking about how the world is, such that the world could be otherwise than how you take it to be. So it's the idea you take the world to be a certain way, and you represent it thereby, and then the world may not be so. A simple example, um, I mean, the more extreme cases would be I could still think, I could think I'm in Berkeley, where in fact I'm still actually in Wollongong, that would be dramatic. Um, but you could think, for example, that um, because of the lighting, that this is actually a blue um, container, when it's not. Uh, so you represent the world and you take it to be a certain way. Uh, and the idea is all cognition involves something of that kind. Or the other version is, no, not all cognition involves that. That's a rather specialized branch of thinking. Um, not not the basic format that helps. I'll, I'll give you some more on content in a bit, but yeah, it, it helps to situate what the debate is really about. Okay. So one of the things I want to just touch on is people have complained that this actually this view that we've been propounding anyway is not in any case a true alternative. So a lot of people have complained it doesn't actually add up to an interesting thesis about, or even a theory about cognition at all, and that's been a popular response to this. So what does it mean to say that? Well, here's Ken Azawa uh, from Rutgers, and actually he, he liked the kick t-shirt so much he decided to wear it. Um, and he says that rec is not a real alternative to kick because the two frameworks are interested in different explanata and employ different explanatia completely. So here's a quote from him, directly on our stuff. Rec, quote, threatens to ignore cognition and does not so much solve traditional problems as merely walks away from them. Right? So it is, it is suggesting a radical framework shift. That walking away from problems is not unusual when you change horses in a theoretical race and say, well, we're not going to do that anymore. But this first point is really important. What he wants to claim is that Rec is only concerned with cases of behavior. Cases where there's behavior without representational content. So he's not saying it's untrue, and he's not saying it might not be worthwhile, but in some small corner of things. But it's no threat whatsoever to the traditional way of thinking, and indeed it only concerns itself with behavior, not cognition proper. Um, I didn't give you any motivations for this yet, but I would have been pulling stuff out of, of robotics and number of cases and explaining what looked to be face value instances of cognition, so this is an interesting claim. And here's Larry Shapiro making the same kind of move. The body cognition, of which inactivism is a species, remains compatible with a representational characterization of mind. So that's the definition of the conservative embodied inactive story I just gave. That's exactly it. If you try to combine elements of the new dynamical system stuff, but you can retain the idea that minds are essentially representational, and there's a lot, a lot of people, right? I'd say the majority of people working on them probably there, then you get that result. And then he says, indeed, if it did not, I'm not sure how it could be a science of the mind, rather than, say, behavior. So the idea would be, if, and you can see the operation of kick, the first version I gave you, simply put, the inference is, if you don't have content in the sense of representations, in the sense I just gave you, then you must just be talking about behavior. Because having representations is what defines being having a mind. So on that model, there is no other way to present a story that has contentless cognition. The very idea of anathema, it's, it's, it's unimaginable. It's inconceivable. That's the, that's the line of argument. Okay, so... Defending kick, I just want to be clear about this, defending kick on, on these analytic grounds, or in this way, by appeal to what essentially defines cognition, is, as in a recent paper picked up by William Ramsey, not supported by proper scientific outlook, right? So I think one has to be very clear, especially working in the circles of cognitive science. So you may produce such an argument, 
I don't know what you have to back it up apart from stipulation, but you may produce this argument and you may try to, in, in analytic circles you would, if you would look for your intuitions and you say you strongly intuit this and then you have to explain why your intuitions justify making these kind of strong claims, but that's the way you can rule this out. But people who are working in the public sciences get alarmed when they hear this. It's an interesting fact that the two figures in question are about self-avowed naturalistic philosophers who disavow using intuitions as a basis for their arguments. So it's an interesting question whether how they thought they could make such claims given their own methodological scruples. So there's a kind of conflict here. But I'm going to not allow these kind of methods. This will become important to the argument as we go along. That's a methodological foul in my book. So let me just say a little bit more about why that's so, so that you can be clear. Uh, the Ramsey paper on this is really very good. He says, he gives three arguments against using this kind of analytic defense of representations. And as he says in that particular paper, although he does have analyses, he hasn't got a dog in that fight when he does that analysis. He is talking about the precise thesis that we were propounding. He says, first of all, it's going to unnecessarily restrict theorizing about cognition, because now we're just going to, or we're going to do some kind of scholastic maneuver where we just have a moving goalpost of what counts as cognition gets smaller and smaller. So we get relabeling. As we find more and more phenomena that we begin to think actually could be explained without content, we relabel that as mere behavior and we shift the, the goalpost along. He thinks that's not the, the proper mode for science. More importantly, it pretty clearly, and that's on that space, it undermines the empirical nature of the representational theory of mind. If you think the representational theory was a substantive explanatory hypothesis about the nature of the mind that is at risk of possibly being true or false, but depending on how the world is, you don't, you can't then dictate without going from the armchair that is it all cognition is thus and so. The argument given about that could be done without looking at any empirical evidence whatsoever. We know what minds are, we know what properties minds must have, and we don't have to look into the world to discover that. We can just relabel whatever we find. So potentially even, uh, the most extreme version, there could be no minds if it turned out that there was no such thing as the content and the form that they insist upon. And finally, it also encourages, and this is the thing I really want to be careful and I want to this is my Chekhov smoking gun. I want this up front, okay, so be aware. It encourages substantial weakening of the notion of representation. So you're going to need, through this talk, to watch what happens to the notion so it doesn't move from the one that we just discussed, you asked me about, which is their official banner notion, to something traveling into something much weaker. And this is something I think that's very insightful. So Ramsey says, look, you know, the danger here is if you know that a priori without doing any experiments, then you will know that representations are involved in cognition without looking at the world. And so you will know when you look at the world that whatever you find is a representation. And you don't know what properties, so you don't know what properties representations have to have. They just have to be whatever gets cognition done. This is also what I call the whatever response. You know, whatever is you find is a representation because we knew in advance for analytic reasons that there had to be such things. This is not a good way to go. Just about anything that plays a mediating role in processing gets described as a representation. RM, our, our re representational theory of mind, is slowly becoming the causally relevant to the processing theory of mind. And this is going to be particularly important because when we move on to the stuff about the imagination, the question is, my question is, does imagination have to involve content? That's my thesis. I will try to demonstrate it doesn't. In fact, it's detrimental to think that it does. Shocking. But, if you reinsert insert this along the way, and we'll do it one more time, it'll happen uh, before we move on, then you will just assume that there has to be content because there has to be representation because that's just what you're calling anything that plays that role. That's not an interesting thesis. That's not a substantive thesis about the nature of the mind. Okay, so I'll come back to that methodological point later on. So that's the title of the, the recent paper. It's so online first, as it were, at this point. The point is, which, are we offering, as Kokusai promises, a substantive explanation, saying there are certain properties that play an explanatory important role in our thinking, or are we are giving an analytic stipulation? So be careful because people waver between the two. And methodologically, it's critical to know what you, what's behind your reasoning when you want to make the argument that you're trying to make. And here's the point. 
the dilemma is, and I think he's right, there's a point of logic, you can't treat representational posits both ways at once, right? You can't treat them both as interesting explanatory constructs and at the same time as a necessary condition for the legitimate account of the phenomena you're trying to explain, right? So if you use them to demarcate or define function, in its essence, you can't also claim that the representations are playing the other role, which is to, ex to explain they're, they're playing as a speculative, uh, a uh, risky, but also, you know, possibly, with, with great risk comes great possible payoff explanatorily, right? With this, if you know, if you're guaranteed that your theory can't be wrong in advance, you get your, your epistemic security at the cost of not saying anything explanatorily punchy. So that's the, the dilemma faced by somebody who mixes those strategies up. Okay. So let's just take a look at, do you guys know Alva? No way? He's nearby and stomps around. So actually in the paper when Shapiro was um, attacking me, he says, look, there's a form of an activism that uh, anyway is keckish in the sense that it allows for representations and it allows for um, contents. This is the 2004 Alva. I know people will be thinking that's not the Alva you know and love, perhaps. Certainly in action and perception, and I've written on this myself, one of the debates I had with Alva was the first version was full of talk of representations and contents in just the sense that, that I'm objecting to. And actually in 2005, along with other people, uh, Ned Bloch made some of the similar worries that there was something unstable about that version of an activism. I won't rehearse those. But actually that's where I coined the term conservative versus radical an activism. Since then, new books, this is 2009, you've had the versions of these more radical approaches based on the Gibsonian stuff that don't have any account of content at all um, to give us an account of perception and action. And then later on, 2009, Alva's doing exactly the same thing and disavowing the roles for representation, and that comes up in the 2009 book, and even more forcefully in varieties of presence. So if you think about the point I'm trying to make about the methodological problem, it looks like, okay, it looks like Alva moved away without loss of, like he didn't stop talking about cognition with this book when we shifted here. So, sorry, here. So in Alva's case, just to take this as a, a, a living example. So does Alva start to produce a theory of behavior now here, when he's trying to understand cognition or perception without content, as he now does in his later works? That could be wrong about the theory. I'm not talking about it, just methodologically. Otherwise, he ceases to be interested in cognition, although he's interested in exactly the same phenomena, but he's explaining it in different terms. So this is the worry about Writ, writ large, that's the worry about that containment thesis. And it's interesting that in Shapiro's review, where he attacks the, the, the thing, he invokes Alva as a saint, a patron saint of the Keck story, in which you could explain this uh, in this way. So here's an instance of would it turn out to be the case then, if it did turn out to be possible to explain perception in entirely non contentable terms, as some of these authors and myself claim. Would it mean that perception and action is just behavior, not cognition? Because that's what the thesis would have to say. So that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the strangeness of that analytic maneuver. So here's another way to take that on. Uh, some representationists have said, yeah, okay, that's fine. We, we accept that that's not the way we want to go. But look anyway, and here's where I'm building up to the bigger point. Look anyway, um, there is an interesting line of response to the moderate representationalist, which is to concede that the notion of representation is not best posited in immediate actual context, perception and action cases of that kind. So that's a concession. So another move is to say, okay, we'll stop trying to convert you into the idea that you're only doing behavior, but let's show you that you've only got a small slice of the story. We'll let you have some online instances of perceiving and acting, and you should be satisfied with that. That's a lot of cognition, but you know, and it's real cognition too, but there are real limits. It won't go very far. So here's the second point. Representations show their real value where we want to make connections between actual context and other less immediate ones. And in the background he talks about, and you can imagine the cases, dreaming, offline cases of imagination, dreaming, counterfactual thinking, all those cases where the thing that you're in, in, engaging with isn't literally 
co-present and you're not interacting with it in any way, not in any immediate context, anyhow. And so the thought is representational. Uh, if I had longer time, which I don't, I would go through this, um, the build-in stories about neural reuse, and this hooks in with a lot of data to say, well, that must be where representations come in. And the thesis there would be the very same patterns, when they're put to a different use, become representational in those secondary contexts. And so it's a split, divide, divide up the spoils, and we can say, look, some of these things can be explained without content, some really can't. You can't get by without a representation. Now, so to say that, again, some allow that basic online perceiving could and might actually be content-free and non-reputational. So there's a concession on the part of some. It is possible to conceive this much direct, they think, while still holding that forms of offline cognition cannot, this is important, so notice how that argument actually works, cannot be explained without appeal to representations. So, the, so I'll look at this in two formats. There's one way you could run it in the analytic format, and there's another way you could run it. The first, it's unclear these particular authors, which of the two they're using, given what they've written. So the logic is kind of simple. If you're using this simple logic, put it like that, you'll have a problem. It seems we need contentful representations when thinking about things that are absent or not strictly perceivable in your local environment, namely things that are not or cannot be objects of your immediate perception. So if you think that anything, so be careful, anything that um, if you engage in that capacity, necessarily involves representing, because that's what it is to represent, right? Is to think of something when it's not present. If that's the definition of representing, then we've made the same mistake again that we made earlier. So let me try to be utterly clear so that we forestall that. That would be... Can I just um, so, so that's what you meant with online and offline, whether the object that you perceive is actually there, then it's online, or...? It's a terrible distinction, and yeah, if I was... And, and, no, it is, and I would say... It's a terrible distinction, but it's one that's used in the literature, and I use it here, so I'll just bracket that, only for the sake of making this simpler, right? There are excellent arguments about why that notion is not viable, and there's been a lot of arguments, mainly because often in the cases, the thing that you're imagining is, is actually you're manipulating, or you're engaged with things offline, and are you online or offline when you're seeing a sunset? I mean, there's a lot of philosophical... I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to... Here. So the way it's used yep. in the literature is that when you actually see the sunset, that means online, Correct. and when you reimagine it, Correct. it's offline. Uh, exactly. Okay. So. That's all I needed to Yeah, it's exactly it's, so. It's, it's very bad terminology because of the internet. I mean, of it course, make of any course. Sense. It's, it's bad, okay. and many people have, have assaulted it, but it's basically as you say. Okay. So it almost, it's analytically the same as the idea. It's presence and absence. It is just. Okay. So that's the idea. And if that's right, then we would run up into a necessary finish line, like we would only ever be able to deal with certain low or if n, and that would define the limits of this program in advance, analytically, necessarily, right? It's but, 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 you know, what's interesting is, is that, you know, um, just the experience of being online um, subverses, you know, the whole intuition of that distinction as it's made for these people, so that's really fun. Well, but I mean, hang on to it a moment, because there's a deeper, the oh, deeper, sure. the yeah. deeper um, I think, and if I ask people in this room right now to raise their hands honestly, I, I suppose a lot of people will think it's quite right to think that if the thing isn't present, then you must be representing it. So if, it's, if there's a must in that thinking, I'm trying to expose that there's a problem. I mean, let me give a full-blown methodological problem second time around. So, again, this is a form of armchair stipulation. One has to watch it. The presence and absence criteria is another analytic move in the playbook, right? It's not been shown that representational content is needed substantively to plain imagining, even if I accept what they said. Right? It's not. All that was said without looking at all about what properties are involved in imagining is we know analytically that if you're if you're able to think about something in its absence, you must be representing it because why? Because that's the definition of what it is to imagine, and if it's also the definition of what it is to represent, then that's all you've got. But if I asked you substantially what processes are involved, right? what, what do you do, and how does that happen, you don't need to know. You just know that that's given out. So this is what I said at the beginning. I wanted to pull a few tricks. Right? These are my tricks. By the way, these are technical moves, but it doesn't matter. A technical knockout is a knockout. So if this works, they lose. So, and the argument is either you retreat to the analytic 
and non-substantive, and then hold your ground and explain how you make the argument, or you have to surrender these. These, these are not arguments for thinking that representation, uh, imagination must be representational, or must involve representational content. Well, that's all I'm doing so far. I'm just setting everything up. Um, so here's a better way to try to defeat me, and uh, Rick Brush. So here's Edward Mascheret. Uh, that's actually a badly written um, sentence. But he's predicted Breck's downfall because he says Grush has argued that physical actions are often guided by representations of feedback. So even simple actions cannot be explained without positing representations. Now this is a substantive claim. Okay? If it turns out that content is involved in this story, necessarily, and that's the best explanation, then I would be in trouble. It's not as it says, it can't be just that Rick Grush argued it, it actually has to be that Rick Grush was right, not just that he argued it, and of course that's what I'm finding contentious, Mascheret's got that slightly wrong. Um, should remember his intentional and extensional distinctions, but the idea, as they put it, Grush himself and his co-author, the inactive approach is unworkable, they claim, unless it makes appeal to representations, and they're making that claim by on, the, on substantive grounds. They want to say there's something to do with the nature of the properties that you need to explain this and sense because those involve content. So that would be a fair test. I will come back and that's going to be a big focus. Of it. That would be a fair test. And if it's true, this is out of the, out of the ring. So here's another, uh, just glancing at another body of literature. I haven't got time to go through the whole of it, but Andy Clark from his Memphis presentation at Spindle saying the same thing. Actually, interestingly, he disagrees a little bit with, with uh, Rick Grush about the need for emulators as exact format, but he too thinks you need content, and I will come back to this point at the end, and he thinks the problem here is that as far as they're concerned, perceivers, as put it in Andy's nice way of putting it, perceivers are imaginers too. They have resources to generate from the top down approximations to every scene they could currently possibly perceive. So if perceiving is infused with imagination, and if you have a substantive theory that shows what content is needed for the imagination, then rap is wrong about even the most basic forms of cognition. So I'm just wrong, 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 if this is right. So if they're right, for my theory, it's game over. So be careful what deal you cut, right? Somebody offers you the perception and then they say, yeah, you can have perception. But then it turns out, actually, perception has got a lot of imagination, so read the fine print. And then it turns out you don't have anything. Well, I want to turn the tables. I want to reclaim the imagination. And in doing so, push deep into the heart of my opponent's territory and start taking back huge swathes of the cognitive terrain. Okay, let's see if I can, how far I can get. Okay, so picking up Shapiro's gauntlet, and this will give you your definition again. So here, he says uh, that Eric and I, my co-author, say little that is likely to shake the confidence of practicing cognitive scientists who wield the explanatory framework that has, or so it seems, yielded a great deal of progress in our understanding of capacities like vision, language, attention, memory, and problem solving. All of these, by the way, typically because you can think about things in their absence. That's one of the core common features that these all give you, right? So this is a very important point why I think the imagination were to go or start to crack will become an issue for them. And then he says, look, I need an analysis of a single case showing how the phenomena associated with, say, episodic memory, uh, mental imagery, or number sense might be better explained without appeal to any content or contrast states. That would be a good start. So he says to us, you know, you might as well get moving, try something like that, and show me convincingly. So I want to pick up Shapiro's gauntlet today. Let's get clear. Representational content is what I said earlier. It's the idea that you're going to take things to be a certain way, and in so taking, that if they are not as they are, there are something like the satisfaction conditions or the correctness conditions of that state of violating. So that doesn't have to be propositions. It could be other things. People have debated this. The propositions are canonical, but the idea would be your state of mind is then true or false, or accurate or inaccurate, or veridical or non veridical You have these nice pairings, right? Correct or incorrect, it doesn't much matter. So how you take things to be is not how things are. Let me clarify the notion of content. Is that's the one that I'm targeting? I will demonstrate in a minute that that's the one my opponents are using and interested in. Um, phenomenal content should not be confused with this, right? At least not with substantive argument, which we don't have. 
If you experience the world as being a certain way, ain't the same thing as you taking it being a certain way, or at least it ain't obvious that it is. Right? So even if you experience that the, uh, the um, room is hot, it doesn't mean that you're saying that the room is hot, even if it feels that way to you. This is a subtle difference, but it's an important one. Um, it's a big issue in philosophy, and one that doesn't look like it's come out well for the representationists necessarily, to, to claim that you could reduce the one content to the other. So I'm not arguing against phenomenality. I'm not saying there's no way that the room seems to you. Descartes ran those two things together, but many philosophers subsequently have taken them apart, and uh, to simply put it this way, would be the polite version, it just ain't obvious that they're the same, right? You need a lot of machinery to show that. So let's not confuse that. Here's another thing we're not looking at, not saying. Call it situational content. I have no better word for it. It goes something like this, that you're currently engaged with something. So if I say what you're, if I just ask, like, what are you perceiving right now? And you describe Berkeley or the trees or whatever it is you're, you're extensionally engaged with, that's not representational content necessarily. Of course, on reflection, you describe that scene. It doesn't mean that you are already representing that scene, right? Of course I don't deny that. Breck says that we have thoughts like that, and then we can form them out of fact. So just to be related to something, or have thoughts about something, doesn't make it representational content either. That's really tricky, because if you read the um, uh, things like Stanford Encyclopedia even, they just, in the first line, run the two things together in a way that is really illegitimate. Um, so you mustn't just do that. So this is important. Yes, go ahead. Is there, you know, contrast to your own argument, would there be any way to fit perception within representational content? Oh, sure. I mean, I mean, well, look, I mean, I, mean, I think it's wrong. So I'm going to try and show you why it's wrong. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it does anything. All of those caveats. But is it imaginable? Sure. I mean, people have been happily imagining it for a long time. I think they're wrong. But that's the most popular view. Right? I'll show you in a second. I'll give you literally now. Right? So does perception have content? Um, perception, this, this is standard. Standard, this is 2014, right? That's why I just picked it up at the APA. So perceptual experience is accurate or inaccurate. If it's accurate, it's accurate in virtue of some proposition P being true. That's the idea. If it's inaccurate, it's inaccurate in virtue of some proposition P being false. But the proposition P just is the content of your perceiving, um, of a perceptual experience. So, so, and here's the, the therefore, a perceptual experience has content, and that's necessary. Right? That's a standard way, of, that's a very familiar way of thinking. So let me give it to you one more time uh, with an example. You see the yellow cup? Seemed well. You see an image of a yellow cup. Let's not, let's not make you monkeys, okay? What is it? For me to see that the cup is yellow. The obvious answer, by the way, obvious uh, for some analytic philosophers, would seem to be, but then we the obvious answer, then it seems to be the obvious answer, but anyway, um, that it is for me to stand in a certain relation, namely the relation expressed by the verb to see to a proposition, namely the proposition that the cup is yellow. Now, this is very old school, right? Some people thought that they were standing in relation to a cup or an image of a cup. But you're not. You're standing in relation to a content. And this is the point. That's not the same thing. So the old idea that you are actually engaging with the cup, which I'm trying to defend, and you're engaging and perceiving an, an entity that you can engage with, and that there's certain ways that it feels and pops up, is not the view. The view here is if you're engaged, you're literally in contact with the proposition. That's what's true or false. Perception, that is to say, a kind of pro is a kind of propositional attitude. And I need only import that content somehow. That content gets imported from the perceptual state into cognition, higher forms of cognition, so that you come to believe it. So this is the view that I'm view. I'm going to make the connection again. How does it play out with the imagination? Here's a classic statement, or even recent, somewhat recent. Among cognitive scientists and philosophers of psychology, there's a growing consensus about a basic account of the imagination. Most people working on this area agree on several substantive claims about the nature of the imagination. What are these claims? Well, it's representational. To believe that P is to have a belief representation with, it, with the content P. Analogously, to imagine that Macbeth is ambitious is to have an imaginational representation with the content Macbeth is ambitious. 
it's basic, right? This is ground floor. If you can imagine, you're imagining propositionally. Most theorists assume that the capacity for propositional imagination is a basic part of human psychology. So that's what sets us apart. Um, and it will be very basic if imagination is in, as we saw in the last slides, part of basic perceiving. So if it's also involved in basic perceiving, then our attitudes are representational through and through. This is, I would say, the dominant opinion, certainly in the analytic tradition. And I don't think I'm telling any porcupines. Um, so the question we put it, what I'm interested in is, do all imagine? That's the threat, that's the refuge. So I'm not denying some imaginings, like I can imagine a death in the format set, of course. The question is, is it basic? And the question is, do all imaginings have to have that property in order to be imaginings? Do they all have to have representational content? Are the most basic kinds of imagining content involving? That's the question. Now, a reason, actually, at first glance, that a lot of people would think may, and I mean may not, is that some imaginings appear to be purely imagistic, right? Um, you might be able to run that without putting any kind of frame on them. And if imagistic imaginings only have resemblance properties, would it follow that they lack representational content? I'll come back to this point again at the very end. And some people have argued that strongly, right? So if you only have that capacity, that doesn't look like you have the capacity to actually... Um, one of the problems about uh, imaginings of that kind is they're not very definite. They don't seem to have the properties that you want for propositions. They don't pick things out. Uh, uh, you have indefinite descriptions of something of this kind, like, uh, if I, or if I was Wittgenstein, I would draw you something here, and then you wouldn't be able to interpret what it was saying, because there's no singular way that you have to take it to be, and such like. We'll come back. Those are classical views. But proponents of that idea, or proponents of the positive idea that they're representational, will say, no, that doesn't matter. After all, quote, contemporary accounts of the propositional imagination are or can be neutral on the vehicle of the imagination. That's how they handle this. They need not treat the content of the imagination as imagistic. Even if you have an image, what's behind the image is a fully determinate representational content. So the idea is that even if you think, well, I sometimes make daydream and imagine in images, they will say if it's real imagination, it has to involve content in some way, and that's possible even if, you're, if the vehicles are imagistic. So that's to, to lay the conceptual groundwork for what's coming. So let's look at imagining that. And here's the interesting thing. Turns out, if you look closely, even at the pure analytic literature, it's problematic to figure out, not like, not that it's just so obvious that, it, and instead of it being obvious that imagination is representational, it's a problem to figure out how it could even be so. And that's surprising. But I want to talk a little bit about someone, uh, a recent paper that shows that as a setup for what's come next. So let's look at this. So here's a paper, and it's on, let me be clear, not other forms, but what we're calling, which is exactly the form of imagination we're interested in here today. He calls it sensory imagination, but that, I don't particularly like that title, but that will do. But he means that all cognition, he's interested in those that involve a sensory mental image as a proper part. And he's focusing particularly on cases of visual imagery, so that will do for our purposes. Uh, and in this paper, Imaginative Attitudes is just actually out as well. So this is coming out uh, online, but it's coming in print sometimes in 2015. So it's re very, very recent. Um, I think it's an excellent analysis. So here's the shocking headline for you. Much of what has been said about sensory imagination conflicts with the idea, conflicts with the idea that imaginings have substantive correctness conditions or veridicality or accuracy conditions at all. And that's what I intend to show you. So the shocking news is, it's not just, it's not just that we might be able to wiggle away into a story, but actually it's not at all obvious that we should think that there are correctness conditions to the imagining. And I'll try and take you through his reasoning because I think it's really well done. Uh, and then I'll give you a bit of his solution, how he wants to go forward, and I'll say why I don't want to follow him down the exact path he goes. But the analysis here, I think, is actually quite brilliant. Okay, so let's look at what he has to say. And we should listen to him, because he was in a rock band. Um, okay. He says one, uh, one uh, very popular take would be to say that the content of the imagining, what, when we come to imagining, is not just what its raw content is, but to figure out the correctness condition, you have to know what attitude is adopted as well, right? So I need to know what the take is on the content and what it's doing, how that functions in our cognitive lives, in order to figure out what would, when it would be correct or incorrect. 
So one idea would be the content is treated as possible. So the idea would be, the as possible view here would be, I, I imagine something and I think that's possible in some format, or that's the content. So that sets the conditions for um, correctness. So on this idea, going back to Yablo and others, imaginings only represent various scenarios as possible. That's how they represent, that's how they function as representations. So on this view, an imagining achieves a trivial form of success whenever it is about whatever we intended it to be about, right? So you know, as long as it's possible, as long as whatever we're imagining was possible in some really wide sense of that term. And as he points out, this kind of success hardly warrants the name. One might conclude that sensory imaginings do not have genuine correctness conditions on this very basis. I'll say it more why in a second, or give an example. The some proposed that these imaginings are fitless, to use John Searle's term, direction fit. They have John Searle himself, well, they don't have any direction fit. Because nothing, there's no constraint on them. What do I mean by all this? Let's just take an example. Um, well, there's one. This is not the real Godzilla, but you have to be imagining the real Godzilla taking somebody out for a walk with a, a brolly on a sunny day. And you have to now say, uh, ask the question, is this imagining of mine correct or incorrect? Well, in some extreme sense, it's possible. And I don't just mean it's possible because this is actually a picture of the guy in the suit, not the, you know. Uh, if I now imagine the real Godzilla doing such a thing, there is no constraint about the metaphysics. We're not talking even about metaphysical possibility. We have a constraint to actual possibility. It's logically possible that this could happen, and so therefore, it looks good. The account of imagination's correctness conditions here, therefore, the worry, if you go with this is the view about its content, is far too permissive. You can fill in all the other examples you like while you're sitting there. The vision of its cognitive role is too coarse grained. It's open to too many things, right? There's nothing constraining it. It's, it's going to come out right all the time. And it's hard to see how that could function in the way we want it in the basic cases. Maybe in some extreme cases in philosophy where we're trying to deal with strange counterfactuals, this kind of thing we might think is addressing the right kind of level of grain. But here, let me give you the example that he gives of moving a sofa. Suppose that Joe imagines the new couch he ordered fitting through his front door. When it arrives, it doesn't fit. The couch has to go back, right? Perhaps the point is it's metaphysically possible. So here, he doesn't just want an account. Say, my imagining was, was fit for purpose. No, it wasn't, because your idea was, I want to imagine the couch's dimension so as I can engage in a cognitively relevant task. I don't just want to imagine any possible, so it's true, it's unconstrained form, um, unless you put extra caveats on, and it's not clear how you can, if you both give the analysis that they give. It winds up being the case that the couch would still fit through the door, it's still going back to the store even so. The imagining is a failure, in terms of our practical needs, right? But it's not a failure because it hasn't failed technically. It's perfectly good. It meets its correctness conditions. Yeah? And in fact, nothing would be a failure for it, whichever couch you imagine. Um, the imagining, uh, our conception of its correctness conditions should reflect what role it plays in our lives, he says. So he thinks these accounts, and I agree with him, are problematic. Here he is taking the counter view which is to say, imaginings present things as present view. And that's, for those people who are attracted to the idea that the imagination builds on perception, that's a very attractive idea because it, the verification conditions for um, perception are such that they present the world as things being thus and so, just as they are, like this being the color that you think it is and it actually matches in the environment. What if we take that view? What if imaginings have the same kind of correctness conditions and same kind of cognitive function that, that perception has? Well. A lot of people, and I'm inclined to think there's something right about this, think that sensory imaginings are derived, uh, ima uh, imaginings are, are derived from perceivings, and they're in some ways importantly akin to perceptual experiences, but what if we say that their verification conditions are determined in much the same way? Then we have another problem. As such, they're true of critical only when the properties of the objects of the kind represented are in fact present, and causing the experience in the right kind of way. Now this turns out to be the other way around, far too restricted. So since what we imagine is rarely, if ever, present and causing the imagining, this would result in an almost, the almost all imaginings being trivially non-veridical, consistently false, right? 
So I imagine something that's not present like the couch, because it's not in my current environment, it's not causing the imagining in the right way, so all of these imaginings are false. And again, hard to see how they can play their substantive roles in our cognitive lives. Turns out, not so easy to figure out what the heck these correctness conditions for imagining would be anyway, let alone that we're already inclined to think that they're playing an important uh, role in understanding our, our cognition. So the moral is this, as he puts it, on either view, the correctness conditions of imaginings do not track the things they ought to track. Things like the helpfulness of an imagining to guiding one's action and achieving one's goals. Those were not, at least in the cases I gave, they're not clear, but it looks systematic. Like, I, you can just fill in all the other cases. You don't have to, you know, I don't have to go through them ad nauseum. The successes and failures of imagination on these views are not substantially linked to the cognitive work that imaginings actually do. That's just a fundamental problem. The result is that the content and correctness conditions attributed to imaginings are divorced from the functional role they play in the broader cognitive economy. So that's bad news for somebody who insists that this, I mean, so let me just underscore this again. If you're a fan of the idea that they have to be on a substantive ground representational, you'd have thought you'd first be able to say how they could be so, and we don't have that yet. <coughs> So anybody who thinks this is a no-brainer or a foregone conclusion that the radical views are wrong hasn't thought through what the situation really looks like on this analysis. Now here's his solution. I just want to mention it structurally. Because structurally, it's okay, but I want to object to one thing and then I'm going to finish up on a positive account and then be done. Um, he says, look, go pluralist and hybrid about how we think about it. Don't think that all imaginings have just one property, and we probably have to introduce some more complexity into the story as well. So these problems with these accounts, they're too simplistic, and they're also too monistic, they're too single-sided. And I think he's right about this point, but not the, the exact way he unfolds it. So he says, just as propositions can be entertained under a variety of attitudes, and I can, belief, desire, uh, which we give rise to distinct veridicality and satisfaction conditions, so too can imaginings. So we need not view imaginings as a class when conceiving of their content, attitude, and satisfaction conditions. Now, he does a nice thing here, a very nice um, little bit of analysis in the paper. I can't take you through all of it, but I'll just give you one little case. So he says, look, on this model, there can be lots of different types of imaginative attitudes. Um, so episodic, episodic memory imaginings, judgment imaginings, uh, each of which have subtypes, and there will be more of these things. So he thinks you can just do a taxonomy of, and now that would be a very interesting mix of different purposes, different cases. So what does that look like? I just want to focus in on one of his kind of cases, which he called jigs. I like the title. Um, jigs are simply judgments that involve mental images as proper parts, he says. And they can be thought of as a subset of all judgments. So sometimes you, you wrap your imagining around with some discursive thought, and then you form a judgment. In this case, right, episodic memory works differently, but the idea here would be, as jigs are a form of sensory imagining, at least some of their constituents will be sensory images. So, so the content of a jig must somehow account for the place of the images, and so the content of the whole jig, which embeds an image as part of its story. I'll give you the example in a second. He gives examples of, of, by the way, of like imagining the Eiffel Tower to be silver. And then you think, um, okay, and then you make a judgment around the edges of this. You think, ah, well, I think it's silver. Or you might think in another case, oh, it could be silver, right? And now those give you the, the divide from the previous two. Some of those will turn out to be false, some of them will turn out to be true. It depends on what the surrounding judgment was, right? And its contribution. Imagining constitutively evolves, he thinks, two components of, and I have it in red, content, one of which pertains to the visual or other sensory image itself, and the other which lies outside of it, and is transferred from one's intentions. Considered together, these components constitute a single judgment imagining. So that's a really complicated sentence, and look, the main point was, as I said, if you think of it having an image, the image gets embedded in a larger judgment, which you have the capacity to make. Now, if anyone smells a rat, okay, it looked like when I was asking whether or not the basic cases had to be cases in which they had content, none of there's no argument here for that. In fact, everything goes against it. 
independently, just on their own, we didn't have a good account of how that could be so. Now, if we suppose the capacity to make judgments that are true or false, and you embed your images in those, yes, I think structurally that's the kind of position that I would endorse. But that capacity isn't the basic capacity for having imagination, right? So the question here is, um, can we rectify this account of the imaginative attitudes? Um, Jose Bermudez, oh, sorry, not Jose Bermudez, no. Jose Medina uh, um, did a paper recently um, defending the radical account of imagination in different terms. And I just want to take a quote from him to show you how it too has a two level structure. So, what you can do is say there is a contentful judgment surrounding a non contentful imagining, and you would get the same structural results that you got. Because I don't think that the imagining by itself, as we just saw, contributes to the correctness conditions. It's rather that the judgment does all the labor in uh, Hassan Langdon's account. So that what happens is, when you have the judgment, you can then intend to be thinking about the Apple Tower in a specific way. And this, by the way, you can find something similar in Frege, I think, uh, indeed. Um, so Frege doesn't think images have content in this uh, truth conditional or propositional sense. But you do have images, and those are going to be become determinate until you use them in a certain format, or you use them to make certain types of claims. So the inactivist account does not, this is clear, and he's, he's reporting accurately our position, does not deny that imaginings often involve representational capacities, or at least sometimes do, and even representational contents. That's also what I said at the beginning, right? The account is split. Indeed, this is clearly the case in sophisticated exercises of the imagination, such as watching a movie or reading a novel, or thinking about the Eiffel Tower in the way that Langlin Hassan says. But, and here's the crucial point, even in these cases, one, the representational elements of the imagination cannot account for many aspects of the imaginative experience, and this would be true of the core of that story. And two, there are forms of the imagination can take that do not require representational contents at all. And by the way, he's associated those views with people like Boran and Wittgenstein and a number of other people who find familiar feet with. So this view shouldn't be taken as a Although radical in the sense of against the current mainstream, it's not in, unheard of in the philosophical literature. So the idea then is that there are ways of acting and interacting imaginatively without representing what one is imaginatively enacting or reenacting. Uh, this is what I want to call the inactive imagination. And he says, preserving the label representational imagination for imaginative activities with intentional aspects. And those would be exactly, so there's an easy way that rep can steal the ball from Langland Hassan, and moreover, there's grounds for doing so because his own analysis shows that if you didn't have the surrounding contents already in place, you wouldn't get the correctness conditions. They can't run the first part of the argument without saying that. So how they got to have a special kind of content on their own is unclear. In the paper, he just says things like they will have some kind of, they'll function more like indefinite descriptions. But my question is why I think they have even that much content or a function in that kind of referential mode. Okay, let me finish up and say something a little bit positive about how we could unpack that thought. So I would look to work by Ravenscroft and Curry and then modify it slightly to get the story going. Uh, recreative imaginings have been understood to be a kind of simulation by these characters in that they produce when mechanisms responsible for generating perceptual experiences are operating to come back to that earlier discussion in a quote-unquote offline mode. What's the support? There's empirical support. Perceiving and imagining share substantive parts of the same processing system while having different inputs and outputs. I don't like inputs and outputs in my stories, but this is their traditional way of running it. Um, the core stage of the processing are similar in structure and function uh, in terms of their, uh, the way in which they're promoted. Imagining is evolutionary parasitic on vi and vision, so it seems. So there's a lot of broad empirical support for the idea that um, imagining, and, imagining and perceiving are kind of linked in important, in important ways. So the simulation of vision hypothesis, proposal, which came some time ago from, from uh, Greg Curry, about 95, was expanded to encompass all modes of perce perceiving, including perception of motor action. So they said, look, just take the whole thing and spread it out. And that was a 2003 endeavor. The simulation theory of recreative imagining is attractive because it promises to explain why imaginings are similar in certain central respects to perceivings, while different in other, such as vivacity, all those classic things that you read from the British empiricists, you kind of get to preserve. 
These offline, call them for the moment, perceptual reenactments, imaginings, are similar in certain central respects to the online proceedings, but they don't replicate them exactly. That's why there's some differences. And there is considerable, if only partial, overlap in the neural processing paths that might help to explain why that's so. So there's all this. You can do it without necessarily the thing being present either in the environment. So all of that makes sense. And that just picks up on the old idea that we're going to apply much of the same cog, much of it, much of the same cognitive apparatus, whether we're working online with input from sense perception or offline with input from the imagination. That's that's Timothy Williams in one of the classic statements of this online offline carving up. Okay. So just to give you a quick example of this test case, if you will, um, to see if that makes sense to you. So take hominid or hominid tool-making abilities. <coughs> These are regarded as often the clearest case of evidence that non-verbal animals um, must be capable of offline representationally needed instrumental reasoning. Uh, Jose Bermudez is promoting that to some while back. So the, I, the exciting thing is that, you know, ants and termite wands were made by chimpanzees. These are really rudimentary. Then you've got things like the simple hand axes of Homo habilis and the early old one kind of tradition. And then you build up to the really fancy stuff. Um, that is the fashioning of the Labawa flake in the middle Paleolithic. So you have flakes within embedded within other flakes. And that was a real uh, achievement. It takes archaeologists, I'm told, at least you know six to eight months to learn how to do that. So it's, it's, it's clearly you need an apprenticeship in this capacity. It's not an easy thing to do. I mean, even if you look like that. OK, so. So that's usually driven as an argument that instrumental beliefs, you get this, are needed to enter into the picture when two conditions are met, and these would be met in these cases to explain how tool making is possible. The goal of the action should not be immediately perceptible in the here and the now, and there should be no immediately perceptible instrumental properties. The creature should not be capable of seeing that a certain course of action will lead to a desired result that would take them, initiate their behavior. So you have to have that properly absent notion in place. And it, it's given the way that you had to get the particular stones and their distance, there's all good speculation that these early hominids could not have traveled those distances. They had to think about things in, at a distance and in their absence. So this is pretty clear cut. Good, the best case you could have for a really non-verbal case. Why? So for thinking you have to have representations involved. Um, for this reason, the instrumental component of intentional action cannot always be understood at the level of perceptual content. That's the idea. So it has to be imagined and it has to be used at that instrumental format. Well, let's just see if I can imagine imagining now the finality without content in this case, because this will give you a clear example of a basic case of imagining. What do we got? In sophisticated forms of tool construction and manipulation, a creature is representing the outcomes of a particular course of action in a manner that we would so Bermuda says, most naturally modeled in terms of a sequence of instrumental statements. So the cognition would come in the form of a set of instructions or statements that drive the action. And that's the most natural way to go, he says. Well, perhaps we would. I don't know what your predilections are. I don't. Um, but the question is, should we? And in my earlier book, I actually I think I want to send out a thing I call the IKEA test. So if you're really in, in, interested in doing this, I think it would be good. I'll send you the instructions on how to build a bookshelf without any images, just a bunch of instrumental statements, and see how well you get on. Right? You, you know, all the instructions will be exactly there, but only in you know, discursive format, uh, with all, all the steps you have to take, with no model, like nothing, no interactive imagery. I don't think that's the best way to understand, even here, the putative content of the tool user maker's mind. I don't think that's going to be the most natural way to understand the, how we come about it. In fact, I think it's no accident that even when they have these textbooks on it, they do the diagrams and they try, even when they, some of them have the hands in them, some of them miss it. You still have the motions, as you can see, about if you want to understand from the diagram what needs to be done, the instructions are already engaging your sensory motor system in such a way that how would you manipulate that object and, and use it in certain ways. Um, yeah, there's written text below it, but that's not going to be particularly helpful. Like, you won't see exactly how to use these or how to manipulate them if you only had the text in that format. It's hardly the obvious basis for that capacity. All that's really needed is actually, and this is the point I need to make, not just having a debate of like, oh, there are two possibilities, which do we need to think? Because all I need is, is it possible to do it without representations? And it surely is. 
Because all you really need is a capacity for flexible, recreative imagination or perceptual reenactment. The process that generates these action patterns relies on a principle of perceptual resemblance. Accordingly, um, Donald calls that mimesis or mimetic skill, right? So we've got some capacity that, it, that in some way picks up some of these features. So even if we talk about offline perceptually grounded imagining, it's ideally suited to and sufficient for the task of remembering and finding a stone that looks like this and fashioning it or napping it in this way and then that and not that way, right? So you find your way through this by means of engaging the material right in front of you. As far as an acts of imagination come in, from your previous experience, you may be imagining how you might manipulate it. But none of that seems to involve propositional content whatsoever. Hominids are likely to have been able to practice, rehearse, and refine their manual skills by exercising their recreative imaginations through simulating sensory motor activity of this kind. Um, it looks like the sort of cognition required for tool making may need to be offline, could be in their sense offline, instrumentally mediated, hence not a form of direct perception, all of that you can have. Still, it does not follow at all, there's no logical entailment, that it requires the manipulation of content involving representations. Or, come back to the earlier, when you're imagining the stone, if you're, how it might possibly break or split, if you're somehow imagining in a way that would be correct or incorrect. What can be agreed, therefore, is that these early hominids were engaging in sophisticated forms of practical reasoning involving some kind of mental rehearsal, where that we, it's an open question how we should understand that mental rehearsal. And I would argue you don't need to have representations involved in the story. Um, not when we get down to brass tacks. So, resemblance is representation. If this involves resemblance, you might think that it, it implies that it's going to be a form of um, representational content, but don't, don't think that too quickly. Resemblance theories of psychosemantic content flounder whenever they rely on things like similarity metrics. So if, this, if it's really resemblance is a driving property of this, then you certainly don't want content. Why? Well, first of all, if I had Jerry Fodor here, it's one of the few times I'd really want to bring him in the room, he would tell you himself that resemblance isn't sufficient, right? One thing may look like another without standing in any kind of referential or representational relation to it. Identical twins look alike, for example, but they don't co-refer. And if you should, so same with coins, if you stick a coin in your head, it doesn't make it representational either, right? So just having the property of resembling and a functional property that's manipulable, right? So I can do certain things on the basis of those resemblance properties doesn't make them uh, referential. Secondly, it's not necessary, as we know. Words refer, but they do not, for example, need to resemble the things to which they refer. So you don't need things to look like what they refer to. We all know that from basic philosophy of language. So there's no sense in which resemblance is either necessary or even sufficient for content. So just the fact that we're talking about resemblance properties ought to make you think we don't need them for them to form the functions they require. The other good thing, though, about the resemblance properties is this. Unlike the other account, they're tethered to something that you would be dealing with if it were present, right? So now it resembles in some important respect the object that I'm manipulating, even though that object's not present. So we don't have the problem that Langlin Hassan mentioned earlier of it being too permissive. Right? We have an actual functional story that fits the role it plays in early cognition. The development of these basic imaginative capacities connected to that is likely to have been strongly constrained, therefore, by the kinds of things which our forebears had to deal with. So the idea would be um, the way that I can imagine these uh, engagements is partly to do with my experience with the engagements of the things in when they are present. And the kinds of things I'm at least basically imagining will be of that format. So actually, a very nicely named material engagement theory by Mathuris says, look, early stone tools sees them as an active cognitive prostheses, um, capable of transforming and extending the cognitive architecture of our hominid ancestors. Okay, so what is all this big, like what this whole debate is coming to, I think these are some of the big punchy results now, is that we're really reversing the order of thinking about what cognition is. As he puts it really nicely, stone tools are not an accomplishment of the hominid brain. But this is a result. They are an opportunity for the hominid brain. That is an opportunity for active material engagement. Okay? So it's not, as he thinks, that we come first with our imaginations and create products. And by the way, 
if this is right, we can just give a sense of its importance, transforms how you think about the arts, archaeology, artifacts, if education. education, too, indeed, and indeed how you would educate. The directed action of a stone napping does not simply execute, but rather brings forth the napper's intention. So it's not the other way around. The decisions about where to place the next blow and how much force to use are not taken by the napper in isolation and they're not taken prior and they're not instructions about how to move your mechanical behavioral body. They are not even processed internally. I mean, I could have written this passage. I'm delighted to find it. Um, um, uh, the flaking intention is constituted at least partially by the stone itself. Information about the stone is not internally represented and processed by the brain to form the rep form the representational content. I could kiss him. That was great. I mean, intentions are embodied and discovered in action through interacting and engaging with the material. And thus, the locus of early human thought stays with the body rather than within the body. And so this is the idea also that we've expressed, not the extended mind, but we've argued in recent publications for the idea of the extensive minds. Minds are already widely ranging into the world, and there is no metaphysical barrier. I mean, we must get beyond that kind of Cartesian dualistic style of thinking. Um, so here is the example, and this is, I think, really nicely telling. The force and angle of the napping are parts of a continual process and thoroughly temporal web of interactions that involve complex feedback between the limbs, objects, the visual subsystem, and the acoustic subsystem. And as you rightly said, like, the sound, if you're doing this and you're an expert, you become you know that the sound is off, you know not just that it looks off. So your full engaged senses and interactions with these objects become important. And you can kind of almost grasp that. Now here's the little sting in the tail before I finish. There's a little, there is little deliberate planning involved, but there is a great deal of approximation, anticipation, and guessing. And this ambiguity, uh, and thus ambiguity about how the material will behave. Now this is the last ditch attempt, I think, for, and I'll just finish on this, the representation is to try to steal the ball back one more time, one more time. I won't have time to go through this as fully as I'd like, but I'm just going to leave you with this last thought. So, it's as if now, you know, the Empire seizes the moment to strike back. And they do. So, beyond simulation and material engagement would be the idea. You know, okay, maybe all of that's true, and they would hand that to you, but the Keck story that I mentioned at the beginning, sends in the troops now. So remember, we were told the inactive approach to imagery is unworkable unless it makes feel for representation in the substantive sense. I opened with that, so I have to finish on this. So here's the simulation theory that I was just talking about, and they'll say that's inadequate. So they'll say the simulation holds that the subject engages in an offline way the same set of active behaviors that would be involved in the overt case. Right? That was the idea you engagements kind of carry over even when the thing is absent. But they introduce what they call the emulation theory, which holds that the subject engages in an offline way the same set of active behaviors that would be involved in the overt case are the same there, but with an additional clause. And in addition, targets those behaviors on an internal model of whatever it is in the overt case the overt behaviors would act upon. So in this case, if it's the stone, then you have to have an internal model of the stone, otherwise you couldn't explain the anticipations, they say, before you interact with it. So you need an internal model of the stone in order to explain the capacity to make the guessing approximations and all the anticipations that was mentioned in the last part of Lambros's uh, speech. And here they just give this definition of a model, so this is very important actually for the argument that we'll just finish on. The model is something M, uh, something M is a model, for X, for some agent A, you don't need all that garbage, if A can use M as a stand-in for X. That's their role. So it's standing in for the absent stone in order to help me make anticipations about how I will interact with the stone if, if that I imagine. Or if I imagine the case, like, I've given the case where you're on the online case of manipulating material, but you can imagine practicing mentally about how you would deal with it before, and that could happen as well. So that would be better for their story. Like in those cases, it looks like, well, what are you interacting with? The thing isn't present, so there must be a standard. Gruss's objection to rec is more specific, actually, though, than presented earlier. It's that the inactive approach is unworkable unless it makes appeal to representations, and then there's a clause understood in a particular way. So this is going to be important legally. 
uh, not understood as pictures, to be sure, um, or sentences for that matter, but those aren't the only options. And the option they favor is model in the sense of a stand-in. So this is going to be pertinent to our whether they've actually won or lost this debate. So they say rather than taking indicators, or well, this is another group of theorists, but they much the same spirit. Rather than taking indicators or pictures or words to be the analog of mental representation, I believe neuroscience and psychology recommend that we adopt representational paradigm models. So it's models that are going to stick us. It's not going to be these other old school ways. It's models now. And if you keep models in, you're still going to have representations, so the story goes. Andy Clark, this is his very line for saying, this is how predictive coding in the brain, all these new stories of this sort, is a way of having your inactive cake and a body cake and eating it too. That's Andy's preferred cake. That looks pretty gross to me. Um, I didn't want to eat that at all. So I'm not trying to have it. I just want to get rid of it. Um, the crucial questions, and I'm just finishing on this slide. I won't be able to take this to the full degree. But the crucial questions that should be buzzing in your mind about whether the, you now think there's still anything left here would be this. Do the so-called model representations they're talking about have anything like content? I will write a paper within the next week or two to show you that even when Andy unveils what he means by content, it's gone so far into the long grass that I think it's not even viable to talk this way, nor would the old school representations recognize it. So for example, he says, it's not content that you could express in English language. It's probably better to be described as a differential equation. It's as far away from the mirror of nature as possible. These are just a few quotes. Okay, This is not an intuitively robust, and I don't think even necessary for explanatory purposes, notion of content. Uh, so I would argue strongly that this is like a, you know, an old a relic of the old way of thinking that's somehow still stuck. The question you really need to ask, though, is this. Do they stand for something? Or do they only stand in for something? Or do they only stand in relation? So those are quite different relationships. Uh, do they exhibit reference or mere upness? I mean, we don't talk about a model referring to something. We talk about a model as a means of a, a gadget, from, in, in best the case, to manipulate, to get in contact. So they could be, models might be completely inactive friendly if it turns out that they're just means of, of enabling interaction. So even if the modeling story was in some way true, it wouldn't follow that we would have uh, these interactions. Can they be explained by responses to, and this would be the next question, co-bearing properties, playing a special kind of functional role, even at a distance, that would be my preferred account, and if that's so, but without therefore involving the notion of representational content as an intermediary or in some way even a feature of that way of engagement. And I don't see why that can't be done at all, given what's been said. So if that's right, I think Darth Vader is going to be called home for lunch pretty early. Um, and the last quote I would just give you from Andy's own question, he just raised this very recently. He says, why not simply ditch the talk of inner models and internal <coughs> representations and stay on the true path of an activist virtue? Why not indeed? Impossible. 
I mean, I, I didn't have all the quotes where what we were saying is inconceivable. Literally, literally inconceivable what I just did. So if I'm wrong and he's familiar, uh, then he'll equally have the same stigma. But it may be that his position, it's hard. You have to know, I'd have to know the detail. And it's a really tough question. Because um, even with Andy, it's taken a while. So like Andy, I'm not answering, not answering about Kenneth Smith and I don't know enough. But to give you an example, when I was finishing up on Andy, it would take a while. Because Andy says, as you saw, I'm going to stay representation full on. But then it takes everything back, and representations look even farther away from anything recognizable. So if, if it turns out they don't have the properties that we discussed when I was saying it, they're really far away, then I don't think there's a substantive difference. And yet that's progress, because it's not like, oh yeah, now if everyone comes to see that, they didn't see that a few years ago. And certainly that's not the case of, like, there's shifting of feet even if people don't announce it, right? So there's tons of people saying action-oriented representation is necessary. It turns out that action-oriented representation is not representation in the sense at all. And by the way, there they argue they have to bear content. So it may be that Campbell Smith stuff is... I mean, I don't know what do you think. Do you think it sounds closer or further away, I guess? Question. It sounds closer. Okay. But, you know... There might be residual... I, I need to understand more also because I haven't been reading your work. Sure, that's fine. I understand. I mean, that's the counter. I need to get. I probably eventually need to read. I think, though, let me say one thing that I do know is really gossipy almost. But um, I know Tony Chimero really well, and I know that he has a lot of respect for Campbell Smith stuff. Right? That I do know. So I think that he probably wouldn't have so much interest in it if, if it wasn't the case that it was compatible with at least his version of the radical story. So if that's the case, it probably is. But it, maybe it's not targeting the same things as dealing with ontologies, per se. Although there's a question here about what come, how things come into, you know, how things you might count come into being. So, that, so there's an element of this too, yes. Um, to what extent could representational content of models just be kind of an, uh, implicit that it works together? Mm -hmm. um, if, if you don't have a cons uh, propositional content there and you know, it doesn't work together, it wouldn't make sense to you and it wouldn't fall apart. Well, the question is how models are being used right, in culture. That, that's what this issue is about. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what, what, what I take it the opponent who really wants to defend representational so I kind of see this almost like if you look at this from a philosophy science point of view, people eking out of a way, figuring out what they ought to be saying and what's consistent with their story, right? Because we began with a very clear claim about it, and you saw the, that's why I gave you the example, because the goal was really fast. So if you said to me that, I'm like, well, exactly how does that retain the traditional notion? And so what Clark and other people are now up to is like, oh, well, we don't need to keep the traditional notion. So you do need to ask them, like, well, what notion of content are you operating with now that you've decided that you're moving away from the tradition? And is there an interesting debate? So one quote, one paper I didn't put up is Mark Rowland's actually is right to say, if people fudge up their concepts enough, there won't be a meaningful debate here at all, right? For me or either ones. Because we won't know what the claims are, right? So that's, as I would say, not fixing a theory in many cases. You can refine your theory out of existence by simply, you know, so one way of keeping, I said this at the old uh, theory of mind stuff, one way of keeping a ship afloat is to have loose lips, right? So there's that old adage, loose lips sink ships, but actually being loose about what you mean is a way of not saying anything that's going to nail you down to any commitment so that you're always going to have a wiggle room to say, well, I don't, you know, the movies, I don't, well, I don't mean by content what we originally agreed content was. I'm like, well, what do you mean by content, right? Um, so Clark, which, again, it's just in my mind, is a perfect example. He says, it's as far away from the mirror of nature as possible. It's not something you could even report in, in English. So it's not like I can say what the contents of my visual perception is so that it could be wrong. I'm like, well, well, I don't know what that is. Why would I think of that as a content? It sounds like you've got a reaction or a response system. A model might well be, as I said a moment ago, if a model turns out to be something like a, 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 a means by which I engage or interact. So supposing I use models to get around an environment, but I don't represent the environment, that's the kicker. I don't need to represent the environment as being a certain way, and therefore, when the models say that it isn't, that they communicate a content to some subsystem, right? That's the story that they want. There's information passed in subsystems at a homuncular level that then guide the responses of the next subsystem in a stage. That was the traditional 
you're getting is a lot of modification of that traditional account, right? So they're saying, oh, well, there can be the systems don't have to be old school computational, they can be more dynamic, so you get the psychotectonics look much more like what we have now. Then the question was, well, how much of the old story is gone? Well, if they're still whispering things to one another, even however dynamically now, right? Then they're still representational at heart. And that's the claim that they that many of these people are still making. And, they, and Shapiro and these guys are clear headliners. They're saying, but there can be no other way. Others are making it less substantially, but once they lose that. So we'll come to a point of convergence if they say, so like Clark's literal quote from this that I didn't give you was, the models are, what do you say? The, the cognition at this level is model rich, but representationally opaque. So you don't know what the content is. Like we can't even say what it is. If it comes representatively opaque enough, you might doubt that we need the contents. You know, we don't know what they are, we don't know how they work, and I don't know how they function. That's actually explanatorily bad news. Like you're selling me something that's a mystery box. You need content, we don't exactly have to say what that content is, and it ain't clear how that plays a role in cognition then. Right? But content plays a role in cognition necessarily, or it's part of the best explanation. Well, it won't look like part of the best explanation if I can say, well look, maybe it's more rich, but that's just a tool for interacting, right? So I use a model of something. But we'll take an example from dance. People actually mark and they structure the dance in some way, and they use a, 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 you know, the structure of that. That's not inter That's not a problem for for uh, an activist for reading, because I don't have to think that models represents. It doesn't even make sense to talk about that one representing. Supposing I get it to be similar to the structure of the dance, and I do some micro version of it, so that I do the big moves and I practice those. Apparently, marking is a way that dancers are able to do that so they can practice the big steps without going through the whole routine. But that's not saying that the world, that, I mean, it doesn't even make sense. Like, what is that claiming about the world such that it could be false? I mean, you might say, well, it could be out of sync with the dance, right? Those steps could be out of order. That would be right. And so you might think that if it's intrinsically representational, that it represents, that, that's how that would go. We could also say, well, it doesn't represent anything at all, although it has to stand in a, an appropriate correspondence. And that just standing in a correspondence, which is something we wrote in the other book, it, nobody denies that just standing in a correspondence doesn't add up to content. So that's an oddity in that story. So all you need is the appropriate correspondences to hold, but it doesn't follow when that happens, in that case, that you're necessarily dealing with truth. Right? It goes the other way around. It's not like... Merely being a correspondence to something gives you truth. So the example I would give, think about trees and tree rings and those correspondences to whole nature. Nobody apparently believes that just because um, the tree rings stand in a certain relation to the age of the tree, which they do, that they're therefore making representational claims about how the age of the tree. So similarly here with the model, you could even use it functionally, right? It could stand in the right correspondence and I could use it because it stands in that correspondence functionally, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily got a semantics. That's that's a big jump, and that's what's being challenged here. So that, that's where it gets very, very, I mean, you were right to ask at the beginning, like, what's the notion? Because that's the thing you have to keep your eye on. Does it change? Can we do it with less? Think of me as a New Yorker who's trying to sell you this for less. I like, think you can do this with less, you don't need all that stuff, and it's no good for argument, I think, for having it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, it looks to me that the biggest problem that you'll have um, when you say that imaginings do not have content or is that you're going to be accused of idealism. I mean, that's really what this is about, right? I mean, the question whether we have the ability to actually say that what we think or what we imagine is about something in the world. And so we're talking about the connection between you know, thought and world, and we're smart enough that we are not just presupposing that the world exists. We don't want to fall back into a naturalism or, or a naive realism, right? However, you know, it seems like, you know, I mean, you gave us a very long list of thinkers who have basically done, you know, tried to bring back um, at least some sort of notion that can anchor, you know, the act of the mind that we have to something that actually really is in the world in a way that we can actually have some sort of truth, you know, um, game with that, right? And so my question to you is, um, I know you want to avoid the idealism because it, you know, it doesn't help to have any of the, you know, to be just a realist or just an idealist. Sure. But how are you going to convince anyone that thinking alone, you know, is valuable? Thinking alone is giving you everything you need, that you do not actually need the content. Um, 
Well, I mean, no, I'm, I'm, I mean, I was going to say, that's kind of what I was trying to do here. I think that when we looked at the case, so let me just run mm -hmm. the, the story. So it goes something like this in headline chunks. If ever there was something that people thought you needed content for, it was the imagination. Those are all technical arguments, right? They're not general arguments about realism and idealism. So when I get under the skin, um, it doesn't look like it's such a fortified thing after all. Quite amazing. So the Lang Langhassen stuff was very important. It kind of said, hey, look, you, you, you're just taking it for granted that this is a good idea. We don't even know how it could have content. So, so let's just start with that thought. If that's right, as, a, as, a, as an observation, but supposing for the moment that's not wrong, I didn't hear yet why it would be. Um, if that were true, if that analysis is correct, then the idea that you've got explanatory power for making that is obviously false. Because we don't even know how it could be so. So simply do this. Your claim is that you need no, you don't need it necessarily because I blocked that move, right? The idea, if you want to make it analytic, you're, you've got a whole world of pain. So if you want to make it explanatory potent, you better show how it's so. Well, our first task is to show it's even possible. We don't even know what that. We don't even know what do we need for imagination to have correctness conditions. Good. That's a starting point. So if you come and try and sell that, think of this now in a different context. You're selling this to me. You have two competing, like it's the dragon's den, and you're coming in after me. You're selling the representational theory, and I'm selling the non-representational stuff. Right? I come in and I say, you know, you have an expert panel, and, it's, and I send a note in advance, and, you, and you, your first question is like, uh, so how do they have correctness conditions? Then? Since correctness conditions are so important to explanation before I buy this whole thing and invest my money. And you can't answer that? You've got to go home. Now, whatever you think of my account, at least I'm still playing, right? It may be, maybe it doesn't work, but it's better than that. And so you wanted an argument? That's an argument. That's a powerful argument. And as far as the thinking being idealistic, no. Uh, that's to do with the point of the confusion. One has to realize just how, how utterly platonic, actually, this position is. Because the move is to actually make you in contact with propositions or terms. It's very resilient. Right? You're, you're always in contact. Either you're Fregean or Brazilian in the analytic tradition, typically, or how you conceive of these things. So, so when we come back to the, the quote I gave you, you're perceiving, when you perceive the yellowness of the cup, you're in relation to a proposition. You're not in relation to a cup. Right? That's not what you're, and that was Russell, right? Russell, right, was a uh, arch Platonist, and he knew that his logical atomism was not compatible with physicalism. Go look it up. So when modern day naturalists tell you they're being they're gonna just buy into a notion of a resilient proposition, they've got a lot of explaining to do, right? And in our original book we said, well you could do that by just positing that as primitives, like the world, but then you're not explaining. So there's a tension between the naturalistic tendencies. So that's also gives leverage. Um, most people in the cognitive science want to say, how is it possible that we can have a response to situations, not to already pre-made contexts? And so there is another step there, which connects with this idea, right? So weirdly enough, the idea is that we're in contact with bits of reality. I think this is a very Wittgensteinian idea, first and foremost, in a non-intellectualist way. Um, and then we come to be able to think certain thoughts about it. Davidson, Wittgenstein, Brandon, like there's a whole list of people who think this. And it seems to me that there's a lot of good reason to think this. The counter version has got a lot of pressure points. Well, I guess uh, he's joining me. I'm thanking again.